series we have been for, I don't know, a couple of months, and uh, at least uh, probably my second favorite book in, uh, in the New Testament, the uh, uh, book of Philippians. My favorite book is James, the book of James, which Pastor David is going to start a series through the book of James uh, first uh, weekend in October, first weekend in October. But uh, uh, Paul, uh, this was his favorite church. Uh, this church had, had loved him and ministered to him and sacrificed for him. And Paul now is writing uh, some 10 to 15 years uh, after his last visit there on his third missionary journey. He, he's been through a lot. And he's writing to them. The theme of this book is all about joy. And I think joy regardless. No matter the circumstances, whether the things or people or what have you. Uh, 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 Paul had joy, and, that's, and I think that's what he wants those of us who walk with Christ to have, regardless of what's going on uh, in our experience. But in chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, we did verses 1 through 11 last week. I think this is probably, the, this chapter, is, these 21 verses, probably the most, uh, uh, in one place, Paul's spiritual testimony. You know, when folks say, Jimmy, how do I share my story? I always tell them, listen, it's real easy. Answer three questions. Number one, uh, what was my life, my life like before I met Christ? What difference, second, what difference has Christ made in my life today? And then, what do I anticipate to take place in the future? That's your spiritual, as it were, biography. Well, that's what we have with Paul in chapter 3. Those opening verses that we looked at last week, verses 1 to 11, I think uh, Paul assumed uh, uh, the role of, a, of, a, of an accountant who works off of ledger sheets of profit and losses, uh, of, of gains and losses. And uh, Paul had a lot of things that he thought were gains and pluses in his journey for many years. And then he met Christ. And the whole value of the ledger sheet changed. And what used to be important was no longer important. And he had a new set of values of what was really important in his journey. Today, we're going to look at verses 12 through 16, where Paul, I think, takes the role of, a, uh, of, a, of, an, of an athlete, of a runner, who's, who's pursuing and who's pressing and who's focused and who's concentrating on crossing the finish line as strong as he possibly could. And then next week, uh, we'll, uh, uh, Paul will look ahead and talk about that, uh, that his citizenship and our citizenship as brothers and sisters in Christ is really not here, but it's in heaven. And Paul kind of takes on the role of, of an alien, uh, which is true for us, who's passing through this world to the one that lasts forever. So that's kind of what's going on in, in uh, chapter 3. But we're right in the middle of it uh, today, in, chapter, in verses uh, 12 through 16. And uh, let me read those. Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who um, are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. There are three people in this room, three groups of people. Uh, some of you, I think it's a few, but you're, some of you are in the room. Uh, I would label you as dissatisfied. Dissatisfied meaning that you see the glass is almost half empty all the time. Uh, tend to be critical. Tend to be negative. Rarely are, ever, are, are things the way you think that they ought to be. And there are some of you like that in the room. Then there's a second category, and I call them satisfied. You're content. You're comfortable, especially through maybe this season of life. And you're kind of, as it were, coasting. 
toward the end. And then there's a third group, and I call them unsatisfied. Different than the dissatisfied. The unsatisfied, in this sense, they're content in, in uh, what God is, is doing and what is provided in their life. They're not envious, they're not jealous. They are uh, content that Christ really is enough uh, for them. But they also realize that there is more to be done in their journey with Christ, and there's more to be done in their journey for Christ. They are unsatisfied. They just they're, There's still a hunger and a thirst uh, to grow and to mature. Now, having heard those three categories and those brief descriptions, which best describes you? Paul was unsatisfied. Now, I find that very convicting for this reason. God had saved Paul on the road to Damascus in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in quite a transforming moment. Prior to that, he had been a Pharisee of Pharisees and a keeper of the law and a persecutor of, of, of the folks who followed the way, who were Christians, followers of Christ. Persecutors to the point of killing Read Acts 7 and the, and the, uh, uh, and the stoning of, uh, of Stephen, one of the early martyrs. And uh, Paul was the one who, you know, who, who led that, uh, that, that, that death in Stephen's life. Here was a guy who hated Christians. And God met him on the road to Damascus and he never, he never recovered from meeting Christ. He didn't just get the symptoms of the disease, he got the disease. And he never recovered from it. So here we are, 30, 35 years later, after that Damascus Road experience. And Paul is saying, I'm not where I need to be. I've not arrived. There's still more for me to do. And there's still attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in my life that they need to be more transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. I'm not through. And for Paul to write that and to say that, because I think there was, I think there were some that were thinking, well, maybe Paul has arrived. And Paul is clearly saying here, no, I have not arrived. I'm not even close to being where I need to be. So in these few verses, I think Paul gives us some insight in, into how do we how do we keep pressing on and moving forward. In our journey, some of you, like me in the room, some of you, you know, even older, you walk with Christ, you know, 30 years, 30 to 40 years, 50 years, a long time. And it really does become easy if you're not careful to fall into that satisfied category. It's just comfortable, it's easy, it's the coast. After all, there's probably not anything the local church is going to provide for you after all of these years that you can't say, been there, done that. Been there, done that. Not Paul. Paul was going to die running. He was going to die climbing. He wasn't satisfied. Where he was. Anybody had any reason ever to be satisfied because God had so mildly used to those Paul. He said, I am not there. So, he tells us in these uh, few verses, these five verses, what do we need to do to keep pressing on in Christ? So that's what I want us to look at. The first thing is we need to have what I call a worthwhile, worth running forward, dying forward, living forward, moving forward, purpose. Purpose. Let me, uh, 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 let me get you to look uh, back up to uh, uh, verse 12. Uh, Mark, if you would, please. I want you to look at the, this is verses 12 and 13. I want you to look at the italicized word. We'll get into 14 and following in just a minute. Not that I've already obtained what this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting my life behind, straining for it, what lies ahead. Look at the next few verses. I press on toward the goal for the prize 
of the upward call of God. What is he talking about? Go back to the previous verse, uh, verses, the screen, uh, Mark. What is this? What's it? What's Paul running after and for? Well, that's what we talked about last week. It had nothing to do with attendance, though attendance and regularity is important. It had nothing to do with giving, though giving is important. It had nothing really to do with the, the, the disciplines that are important in our maturing and growing as believers. <coughs> because sometimes those can become legalistic and we begin doing them because they're duty rather than out of heart full of love. So what is it that Paul is after? Well, that's what we talked about last week. I want you to go back to uh, uh, verse 8. Because in verses 8 through 11, Paul defines for us what, what was his this and his it and this one thing and the, the goal, the prize, the upward call, which I think we should embrace. Verse 8, indeed, I count everything, everything that I've done in my whole life as loss for the surpassing worth of this number of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung, excrement, in order that I may gain Christ, knowing Christ, gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, not out of self, not out of goodness, not out of human goodness or works, that depends on faith, that I may know him, knowing Christ, gain Christ, that I may know him, and the power of His resurrection, the power of the Holy Spirit living in and through my life as a, as a, as a Christian, and may share or have fellowship in the pain and the sufferings and the difficulty of trying to live for Christ in a godless world, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible, Paul just couldn't believe the possibility of the resurrection would include Him, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead and the hope that kept him alive. What does he say? What's the this? What's the end? Well, there are a lot of ways to phrase it. It's pursuing Christ. It's knowing Christ. Maturing in Christ. Being more Christ-like. You will remember back in January, my word for the year is grow. <coughs> grow. And it's growing in Christ-likeness. It's growing more like Him in attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. More in the attitudes and the behaviors of humility. We talked about it. Of humility. Of selflessness. Of uh, being willing to be, uh, willing to sacrifice, those are the attitudes and behaviors that that people stand up and take notice. Of what we're in, in now with uh, this is uh, this changes everything is really all about generosity, and not just of money, but of time, and gifts, talents, and effort, and energy. All of that is generosity, giving our life away. I've always remembered the first uh, statement. In uh, the the most uh, the, the most sold book outside the Bible ever written is Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. Only one book has sold more copies than that book, and that's the Bible. The first sentence in that book is this: "It's not about you." Where we get into trouble is when it is about us. Is about us. And Paul is saying here, this is not about me. It's about, about whatever time God allots for me. Become as much like Jesus as possible. Now, he begins now, I think, to give us... It's one thing to have a purpose or a goal, or, but how do you get there? What's a strategy? What's a plan that will work to get me there? And Paul gives his plan, and I think it's threefold. First, you've got to be willing to leave the past. You've got to be willing to leave the past. Look at verse uh, uh, 13. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting means not letting... We can't... Our memories are, are such as God created. We, we, we can't really forget 
What he's talking about here is don't let anything that has happened to you in the past enslave and continue to control your life in the present. And one thing that holds many believers back from moving on toward Christ's likeness is they live too much in the past. And it enslaves them and it holds them back from moving on in their journey uh, with, uh, 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 with Christ. Remember Paul's uh, past, so at verses 5 and 6, Paul had persecuted Paul and killed Christians, I said, but yet Paul said, I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to hold on to that in the sense of being humbled by it and to learn from it and to move forward in it, but I'm not going to let it hinder my growth and my likeness to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to let that happen. I didn't run a lot of track. Mike, uh, my, uh, Mike Kelsey, you ran track, didn't you? Mike, you ran track. And some of the others uh, ran track, obviously, many, many years ago. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, uh, it's interesting when you run track, almost exclusively, you, your, 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 your gaze, your, your vision is what's in front of you. Every now and then, you will glance back just to see where the, uh, where the other runners in the race are. But if you watch a track meet, no runner turns their head and looks back, and it stays there. That's a recipe for stumbling, falling, uh, losing speed. I mean, nothing, nothing positive happens when you live looking backwards. Uh, I've not ridden in the car with most of you. Okay, you don't want to ride in the car with me after dark. But I'll guarantee you this. You spend 95% gazing through that front window. And that's good. That's good. See where you're going. Okay. I doubt that any of you either A, turn around and look through the back window, or look in the rear view mirror and nowhere else. Why? That's a crash. That's a crash. Now, do you glance at it just to make sure that everything's okay and you're learning from what's going on behind you? Of course. But the gaze is looking I wrote in my notes, and I think I put this in here because I really believe this statement. If we, if we don't let our past die, it won't let our future live. The, uh, what is the most valuable, the most valuable piece of furniture in your house or apartment? The most valuable piece of furniture. Refrigerator. Couch. TV. Bed. You know what I think it is? That's a wastebasket. Just think for a minute. Think about living in your apartment or in your home. And there are no wastebaskets. I count them. We have six in our house. Okay, and we fill both the recycle and the and the garbage, okay? Week by week, we would pull it out of the street on Sunday night for a, for a, for money picked up. What if there are no trash cans in my house? Listen, if there are no receptacles in the garage or outside the garage to put them in for it to get picked up so you can repeat that process next week? I'm not coming to visit you. <laughs> and you're probably not wanting to come and visit me. This is the most valuable piece of furniture in our house. You know what I think? We need to pray and ask God to help all of us to develop and to cultivate good trash baskets. 
And we need to throw past junk that is hindering us to this day in the present. Even if that junk were successes, we can't live on those. Not just failures, but successes. And put them in the ways back, except to be humbled by them and except to learn from them. But not to stare in the rearview mirror of them and be holding back in our journey. Paul's plan, we gotta deal with the past in a healthy way. Second part of his plan was we I called I didn't I call it lean, lean into the present. Lean, not live. It's possible, I think, to kind of live and exist, but not really lean into the present. In verse uh, uh, verse 12 and verse 14, he uses this phrase, I press on. I press on. I press on. It's the word the oath, though. In fact, uh, Pastor David, I think it's on, uh, uh, on his right hand, has a ring, and the inscription on the bottom of that ring is the oath, to press on. It means to relentlessly pursue a goal, a purpose, and to lean into it with everything that you are and everything that you have. And it's a process. It's a process. He says, I, I really struggle trying to understand, well, what's the difference here uh, when he talks about uh, uh, pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upper level? Is there a difference between gold and prize? And I think there is. I, I think the gold is more for this life, and that is pursued. The goal of pursuing in this life as much likeness to Christ as possible. I think the prize is the next life, where we finally achieve the, per the perfect Christ likeness in attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, and we enjoy an intimacy with Him and other believers that we never knew in this life. And it's pursuing the goal that leads to the prize. And that's what we do here in this life. Lean, not just look, lean into the present. But you can't do that if you don't forget the past. And then look at verse 13. It's very interesting. Look to the future. And straining, that's the only time that word is used in the Bible. Straining forward to what lies ahead. To what lies ahead. Uh, look at this uh, runner. Runner. I almost brought in the uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, clip from uh, Eric Little uh, you know, crossing the, uh, the finish line, but the, 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 the content of the teaching was somewhat different. If you watch, of course, now they said it will have pain. You know, got a you know uh, laser running across, and whoever makes that line first. But you watch those runners; they are straining and stretching, and for and with every fiber of their being to finish that race with everything that they've got, everything that they've got, as they look to the future. And I wrote in my notes early this morning: how much effort. Am I putting in to pursue Christ like this? I mean, do I wake well I wake up in the morning thinking, what could I do today to be more like him with beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors? I don't. Not enough. kind of in verses 15 and 16 a couple of things not to get distracted by in that pursuit number one in verse 15 I think what he's trying to say is don't worry about what others do or think my observation in looking at the lives of most people including Christians they live either by comparison or by living up to the expectations of others. And you can't succeed in either. It will always, living by the expectations of others means you're living somebody else's life, not your own. And if you're living by comparison, you, and, and you compare, then you adjust, and you compare, and you adjust, it's going to lead you to one or two places, either pride, 
or a sense of discouragement and failure. But you can't get there. And what Paul is saying, listen, keep your eyes on the goal of the prize. Don't worry about what other people do or think. Don't ever think that you've arrived. And then secondly, verse 16, I think he's saying, hold, <clears throat> hold true. Don't hold on to what you already know. You and I are only responsible to obey that which we know. Keep growing. Keep learning more, and therefore you can obey more. Don't ever quit. The Christian life is not like a hundred meter dash. It's like a marathon. And you gotta, you gotta pace yourself so you can finish strong. I told you more than once, my greatest fear as a Christian is that I will not finish well. Because most don't. And that scares me to death. Scares me to death. Don't ever get satisfied where you are. Keep growing, keep stretching. Look at uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. If you close with that. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The writer of Hebrews writes this. And he's looking, you know, he's using Jesus as an example. And this is what he writes. Therefore, since we here on earth are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I don't know if that those witnesses are the folks who are watching us in this life. Could be, because certainly people are. Or is he referring to, uh, to believers who have gone home before us and who are, as it were, watching us, witnessing our lives down here? I think both can be true. When you do a study on heaven in January, you'll see my point of that. But we are being watched. So let us lay aside every weight. Many years ago, when you know, when I was uh, working out a whole lot more, I had ankle weights. Ankle weights. You put those a couple of three pounds on each thing, and then you run or you walk. Okay. And after a, you know a mile or two, it's it pretty laborious and painful. But you take those weights off, you feel like you could run on air. Because you're not tied down anymore. Well, those weights that he's talking about are the past. They're not leaning into the present. Not living with hope. Those are the weights. They hold us back. And sin which seems close to us, seems it clings to us so closely it does. And let us run. There's that word. And run. With endurance, perseverance, determination, the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, founder and perfecter, author and finisher, beginning and end of our faith, who for the agony that was set before him endured the cross. Is that what it says? Joy. Joy regardless. Joy regardless. Endured the cross, despising the shame that went with the cross, the crucifixion, and the death. And then the end result, because he knew, and you and I know, because we have hope, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. My challenge to you this morning as we finish is no matter how new or old you are in your journey with Christ, don't be dissatisfied and don't be satisfied. Be like Paul, be unsatisfied and be pressing on until your last breath. I'm not often as a pastor, but it's been enough time through the years as a pastor to be at the hospital side of a bed or in someone's home when they breathe their last breaths. Sometimes I got by there maybe days or weeks before they died, but they were, they were, they were still, uh, uh, they still had awareness. And I, if I can, I always ask this question. If you had it to do all over again, what would you do different? And one that I heard more than anything else, I regret that I didn't live more for Christ. Didn't mean they weren't Christian. They were. But they regretted that they didn't press on with more strain and effort and 
and concentration and focus. And now it's too late. I don't want to die that way. I don't want to die that way. So let's press on in Christ. Okay? Let's look at the questions. Uh, well, how much time? Well, excuse me. The assignment for next week, uh, 317 through 41. And so, again, just uh, uh, five verses, but uh, good stuff as we look at uh, Paul's final part of his testimony, looking forward to the, uh, to the future. And then a few questions to grapple with. A holy discontent. That's where Paul was. A holy discontent. Unsatisfied. Is essential for spiritual growth and progress. Do you agree with this statement or disagree? Number two. Is something in your past hindering your spiritual journey in the present? And then three. What could you do to better press on in Christ? Okay? Father, thank you for our time together. Thanks for the new home. Thank you. Thank you for... Folks loving on uh, me and honoring me as I approach this 68th birthday. I am rich indeed. I am blessed. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. I pray you'll bless this class as we enter into our fourth year. Help us to be more hungry than ever to come and to learn and to, and to, and to apply and to grow and become more like you. Help us to be sensitive to the folks around us, whether it's worship center or neighborhoods, and inviting people to be a part of the experience. And as much as anything, Lord, help us to care for the people that we engage in around our table. To do life together. Bless now the time of conversation, sharing around the table. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.